Hello, today we're going to look at AngularJS in sort of just a basic introduction. Um, but my introduction, I'm hoping, will go a little bit further than um, maybe some of the other introductions you've seen on the web. And uh, just to give a plug to John Lindquist at egghead.io, his videos have been super helpful and instrumental in uh, learning AngularJS. So um, if you're looking for you know shorter bite-sized videos that are super focused and cover uh, you know really small topics, you should go check that out, and I'll include a link to that in this video at the end. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about AngularJS and why you might want to use it. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of a history uh, of how I came into it. My background uh, in front-end sort of web app development really was started in jQuery, just plain old jQuery, which I'm sure a lot of people started in. And I ended up moving on to use Backbone for a large number of applications and really fell in love with the uh, the idioms that Backbone pr proposes and the separation of concerns that it proposes. And for a long time, that's what I would use. And when Angular kind of came on the scene, I was definitely not sold right away, but I think in the last six months, maybe, the number of improvements and sort of it hitting critical mass in terms of what it's capable of are um, led me to experiment with it. And it, uh, it turns out it's a pretty powerful platform, and a lot of the ideas that it exposes really help to make for a good separation of concerns. And I think it's probably the direction that browser vendors need to go. So enough about sort of my introduction. Let's let's talk about, uh, you know, at a high level, what Angular is. It's basically an extension to HTML. You can see the tagline here, HTML enhanced for web apps. And uh, Misko Hevery has a couple of good videos, if you Google and I'll include the links at the end, where he basically talks about, it's kind of what Google's vision for uh, what a browser would be like if it was built from the ground up to build web applications instead of just rendering HTML documents. And I think that's a good good way to sum it up. Uh, it's another way to think of it is it's Google's vision for what web components are sort of isolated pieces of HTML and CSS uh, and JavaScript working together um, to create a rich experience. And it can do what other frameworks, like if you're using Backbone or Ember, it can do a lot of what those do. Uh, but it offers a lot more. There's this idea of two-way data binding, which we'll take a look at. Um, and the whole objective, I think, in Angular is to add sort of a middleware layer uh, that gets rid of a lot of the, the redundant code that you have to write with dealing with the DOM. Basically, you can work with Angular without having to touch the DOM at all, which is, you know, I was skeptical at first, but actually really refreshing. And another thing that I'm going to talk about as we go through building this little introductory app uh, is an idea that Misko Hevery has um, that he talked about in his uh, presentation on introducing the animation module for Angular is that your UI code should be declarative and your app code should be imperative and we'll take a look at what that means. So to start we're basically going to work through uh, a small skeleton of an application that I built uh, and going to step through and hopefully give you a highlight of the, the high-level pieces of Angular. And so you can see that I've got a directory here, and I'm keeping this as sort of vanilla as possible. There's no, um, there's no script bundling, there's no grunt integration, there's no uh, you know, third-party build tool that's doing this. It's just plain old files so that you can kind of really get an idea of, of how this works and how simple it is to get started out of the box. And uh, you'll see that I've got this empty page uh, with pretty much nothing in it but a point or two, um, some style sheets using foundation, uh, which if you've watched John Lindquist videos you should be familiar with. It's just a, a nice little tool to scaffold out some some grid uh, layouts. And I've got this app.js, and there's nothing in it right now. And so if I flip back to the browser, you can see that you know I've got uh, a tiny little dev server which has just set up this static file and nothing in there. So let's look at some of the things we're going to cover today. We're going to look at Angular's module system, creating tiny pieces of, of functionality and, and sort of how to isolate um, things. We're going to look at routing uh, and the route provider. How do we get pages to transition? Because 
when you're talking about building apps with AngularJS, you're probably talking about building a single page app. You don't have to, but uh, that's kind of really where it shines. Um, we'll talk about dynamic behavior and the scope um, and how to avoid writing a lot of DOM manipulation code. And then just extending the semantics of HTML with what Angular calls directives, and there's a number of those. And uh, on the way, you know, hopefully I, I might get to into how Angular does dependency injection, but that's, you know, maybe beyond the scope of this video, and there's a number of other resources that I can include uh, to cover that for you. So to start with, um, I think what we're going to do is look at the, the top level um, construct that Angular uses, and this is the ng app uh, directive. And so this directive here, a directive just means, um, you know, if you're thinking of things in terms of declarative, this directive is going to tell Angular that when it hits the bootstrap phase of its uh, life cycle, it's going to direct Angular's application code to do something. And in this case, um, it's going to point out that we want to uh, have an app that is going to be scoped to uh, this page. And usually you only have one of these. Um, and so I'm, you know, putting this attribute in here and I'm defining this app. And the next thing we need to do is actually go in and uh, create that app. So let's do that. Uh, and the way you do that is, not app, uh, you use angular.module. And then the name of your app. And uh, you provide any dependencies that are going to exist. And that's basically it. Um, it's important to note that if you've come... Uh, looking at other Angular tutorials, um, this is basically a setter, and this is a getter. So the parens or the uh, the array of dependencies is important. Um, and if you try and do this um, before you've defined it, you'll get a weird module undefined error. So uh, if you're defining the module for the first time, you're going to want to include those dependencies. Uh, and if you're attaching things onto it later, you can do that here. So for the purposes of this, uh, I'm just going to assign this to a global on the window called app. And uh, the next thing uh, we, we want to do is, is go back here and see that this ng app attribute uh, has this string of app. And what that's going to do is basically when Angular loads up on the page, um, that app will exist. And oh, looks like I've got a reference error. I might not have included the right path to Angular. Right, I need to include Angular as one of the scripts here. So let's just do that. Go reload, there we go. And so you'll see that um, I've got this app object and nothing really magical happens, except for the fact that that directive on the HTML element um, basically told Angular that, uh, hey, you need to go and wire up this this app so that basically you're aware of this thing. And there's some other properties that got added here, but uh, they're not really important. So one of the first things you might want to do when um, you're building an Angular app is add routing, because the whole point of this is to build a single page app. So we're just going to add a couple of um, pages to the mix. And to, to do that, uh, you use something called config. You're going to configure this app. Um, and that takes a function, and inside of there, I'm going to inject the route provider. If you're coming to Angular from Backbone, the route provider is kind of analogous to Backbone's router, uh, but it does some things slightly differently, which we'll take a look at. And the way that you interact with the route provider uh, is you use these adjectives. So uh, when I hit login, uh, then I'm going to provide some configuration that says uh, I've got a template that I'm going to load, and it's just going to be a simple HTML page. And I've also got a controller that I want Angular to inject uh, and instantiate and pass the right variables so that it knows about what to do. So let's do that. Uh, so we need the first thing we need is a, a template. So let's add that template. And I'm just going to go and grab some code from over here that I have. And strip a couple things out. Um, this is just using uh, some foundation classes. 
So you can see this is just plain old HTML markup. Uh, so there's our template, uh, and I need a controller. So let's just do that right here. And it's just going to be a function, and it's not going to do anything magic right now. We need the controller so that when this um, rub gets hit, Angular will uh, instantiate the controller and we won't get a, an undefined error. So let's take a look. So nothing happens, and if I go to login, and I must be missing a piece here. Let's add the other piece that we need. Otherwise, so otherwise and when are the two adjectives that you interact with. Uh, and we're going to tell Angular that if you don't get a route, uh, let's just redirect to login. And now, hmm. So normally now is when I'd stop the video, but I think you know, it's useful to uh, to leave this here and think about what's going on. What I expect to see is that Angular is going to go and try and fetch this template and inject it. Ah, and this is the next piece of the, the puzzle that we need. So we've got um, this uh, this route def defined. We've, we said that we're going to redirect to login. We've got our controller. Um, but the next piece that we need is uh, somewhere inside of our single page app to inject uh, the actual views, the pieces that are going to get stuffed in there. And this is another directive that we're going to use called ng-view. And I have some other markup I'm going to stick in here. And this is the only markup that's going to go in here. So I've got a foundation row that's going to be this big. Here's my title. And I've got another directive. Uh, this is another attribute directive. And this is going to direct Angular to say, uh, whenever um, there's a view that is going to get rendered, this is where I want you to stick it. So now if we reload, there we go. So amazingly, uh, there was, seemed like there's a bunch of magic that happened there. So let's break it down. So we defined our app, which tells Angular about the existence of this app. We've configured our app with a route provider so that when the login route gets hit, uh, we want to load this template and instantiate this controller. And we've told uh, the app that if you go to any other route you know that doesn't exist, uh, it's just going to redirect to login. Uh, the other cool thing is you know, we just put this template at the root. And I've got a, basically a static web server just serving this stuff on port 8000. But um, Angular actually went out and fetched that template via XHR, which is pretty cool. Uh, the other cool thing is that if I had a different route and I went back to this login route, Angular wouldn't refetch the um, the template. It has something called a template cache uh, inside internally, and so you know the simplest sort of out of the box solution that you get is I can just work with plain old HTML files. I can stick them in here. If they were in some subdirectory like templates, you know, then I could just pass the path. Angular will automatically go fetch it if it's not in the cache and cache it for me, and that's that's pretty cool. That um, this kind of interaction gets you a lot further with, you know, a lot less code than you would have to do if you were working with a backbone router and then setting up sort of a paradigm to, when this route is hit, I want to figure out this view that represents the page and I want to inject it into the right place. So it seems like my experience with Angular has led me to um, a place where they've thought about a lot of these sort of common things that you're going to do in a single page application or in a rich application and they've taken care of some of it for you. And I found that really refreshing. Uh, like I said, I was skeptical at first, but but it's pretty cool. So now let's, uh, we don't need to touch the index anymore. Let's add another route um, so that we can get to another page and see that I'm not just blowing smoke when I talk about that template cache, not refetching the, uh, the templates again. So this one will be the home page. And it'll have its own controller as well. And so now we need to add a controller. And then we need to actually add the 
HTML5. And I'm going to grab some more markup and pull a couple things out. So that it's just plain old markup and we'll kind of work our way through uh, this process. So now if I reload, I've got the login page and if I go to home, there, now I've got the home page and there's just a couple images. And these are the two pages that we're going to work with for our app. And you can see that an XHR came through for login and an XHR came through for home. Uh, but if I go back, uh, you'll notice that now that those two templates are in Angular's template cache, uh, we don't have to re refetch them. So that's pretty cool. And that's a lot of functionality, like I said, that you get just sort of out of the box and you don't have to think about uh, pre-compiling templates. Angular supports that, but you don't have to think about all this stuff. So if you want to get up and running, it's, it's really, really simple. So the next thing that we're going to do is start adding some dynamic behavior and talk about something called scope. So the first thing that our app wants to do uh, is probably going to be to log in. So when we visit this page uh, and we fill out these values, we want to hit the login button uh, and have some sort of behavior happen um, and then uh, head over to the home page. And the way we do that is by interacting with the scope. And so let me take a moment to explain what the scope is. Basically, when uh, Angular, uh, the route provider, triggers this route, it's going to you know, in inject this template into that ng view. It's going to instantiate the login controller. And then it's going to pass, uh, there's going to be a scope variable for each of these controllers. And if you want to think about it as the scope, it's basically just like uh, a channel that's connecting um, this piece of DOM with uh, you know, this scope object, which you can basically assign things to. And so for the purposes of login, uh, what we're going to do is we want some credentials. And then the really nice thing about Angular is that uh, you don't have to work with any predefined um, types. You just work with the things that you're already used to working with if you're used to working with JavaScript, which is object literals and arrays. Uh, and, you know, that's basically it, strings, if, you're, if you really want. And Angular kind of takes care of wiring up all those things for us. Um, so in our case, we've got uh, a username and a password uh, in our scope, and we want to make sure that when the user fills out uh, these forms, that those things are kept in sync. And if you're coming to this from the world of Backbone, you would probably have to add a model, um, which is represented for us by this plain old JavaScript object, literal. Um, you would have to add uh, some a view to render out the form. You'd have to add some events so that when you clicked or when you finished typing into the input, those values would keep in sync with the model and things like that. And Angular gives you uh, something called two-way data binding that just kind of does this for you. And you might think, well, that seems like magic, and I don't know if I want to do that. Maybe you don't. Maybe you're comfortable using Backbone, and that's OK. Um, but for the purposes of this video, we're going to explore what it means uh, to use the two-way data binding. So the way that you keep um, DOM elements in sync, remember I talked about declarative, is you add a directive. And the directive um, that is going to tell Angular to keep in sync with something is ng model in the, in, in the case of uh, form inputs. And the value for this attribute is going to be something that exists on the scope. And in this case, uh, we're going to say that it's credentials.username. And the value for the password is similarly going to be credentials.password. And that directive basically uh, is the declarative way of saying, hey, Angular, when this thing is rendered uh, and you inject it into the ng view, uh, I've got this scope, and there's going to be something called credentials on it. And I want you to keep uh, the values that the user types into this input in sync with uh, that, that object that are and the username property and the password property. So let's see if that actually uh, works. And I'm going to kind of hack at this. Uh, and I'm just going to say window.scope equals scope. 
so that we can take a look. So let's type Ralph and secret password, and let's take a look at that scope object. And there's our credentials, and hey, now you can see that my username and password. And if I change this to uh, Bart Simpson, and we retake a look at that, you can see that that just happened. And that's, you know, you've probably watched other AngularJS introduction videos, uh, and that was sort of one of the first big wow moments was, wow, that's sort of the power of, of two-way data binding and pretty cool stuff. Uh, here's, let's add another directive. Um, let's add a required attribute to these fields. And the, the required attribute works if you have uh, something called an ng submit directive in your code. And basically, what that does is suppresses the normal uh, form submit event. And I'm going to create a function called login. And just like everything else, these the place where Angular looks for this stuff is on the scope. And if it can't find it there, it'll look for uh, it on something called the root scope, which uh, is sort of beyond this. But if you think about the scope and the root scope have sort of a relationship like the prototype does in JavaScript, if a object doesn't have its own property, uh, JavaScript will attempt to look that property up on the prototype, keep going up the chain. That's sort of uh, how Angular works. It checks does this function exist, uh, this login function exist on the scope, and if it does, I'm going to call it, and if not, I'm going to check on the root scope, and if it's not there, then I'll throw an error. So that means that uh, we need to create our login function, so let's do that. And it's just going to be a plain old function, and the cool thing uh, you know, getting back to this idea of declarative in the UI and imperative in in the uh, in the app code, um, declarative just means that you're telling some external system how you want it to interact. So in the in the case of the markup, you know, decorating it with these directives is telling Angular how it should interact when certain things happen. Uh, imperative is basically modifying the state of our application. So when we log in, uh, we want to check the state, and Angular gives us. Uh, the ability to do that because we're guaranteed that this uh, scope dot credentials will automatically um, be in sync. So we can just do something like uh, check the value um, that username is not equal to Ralph, and we're going to alert uh, username must be Ralph. And now we, we'll get a couple things that we'll see here. Uh, so here's our form, uh, so I'm going to do Bart Simpson, and username must be Ralph. So that's pretty cool. So we can see that that is already working. Um, and then the other cool thing is that we added those required attributes right here, and that works with uh, ng-submit to basically use HTML5's um, validation so that uh, the user can't submit the form. This doesn't replace server-side validation, it's just one of those nice to have so that you know that submit event isn't going to happen and our controller login function isn't going to get invoked uh, until the users filled out the things. So that's not very useful. Uh, what we really want to do is redirect to our home page um, if, the, if the username is Ralph. And the way that we do that is using location dollar location. And if you're interested in finding out more about this stuff, you can go to develop at angularjs.org, um, the develop menu, go to API reference, and you can just kind of look through this stuff. The docs are a little unwieldy at first to get used to, but once you kind of have dug through them a bit, uh, you'll find that they're, here we can see location, and we can see that there's a bunch of methods and path is the method that we're going to use. And this is sort of analogous to Backbone's uh, .navigate function in the Backbone history API. And we're going to inject that dependency. So we're going to stick location in here in this function. And what that's going to do is uh, when Angular goes and instantiates this controller, it will look up that location internally in something called a uh, location provider and inject that dependency. And this is part of the magic of, of Angular's dependency injection. Uh, framework. And so we're going to say if the scope credentials username is Ralph, then that's that's what we're going to use as our um, indicator that they've logged in properly. Um, 
and they'll have to have a password as well. But we we don't really care, so we're just gonna say uh, location dot path is home. So let's see. I can get rid of that. Ralph. There we go. We got redirected to the home page. So that's pretty much how easy it is to, uh, you know, redirect between um, different paths in Angular. And so that's cool. Uh, let's add some dynamic behavior to the home page. Right now, all it does is show these images and uh, a message on the screen. You can see there's these two images styled nicely with foundation. We've also got that logout button, so we're going to want to implement that at some point. Um, let's take a look at uh, what we want to do first. So we just got this static markup. Um, and one of the first things we can do is, uh, you know, we looked at um, adding ng model to keep the value of this input in sync with a scope value, uh, the user credentials. You can do that as well uh, when you're rendering things initially. So if, if, for example, I wanted to create a fragment here that uh, had a property called the title on the scope for the home page, now I can go back here and I can just say scope.title equals Senators, because they beat the Canadians last night, many of you hockey fans. Uh, and now I can see welcome to the Senators page. So that's cool. Anything inside of these double curlies uh, is basically going to reflect the value in the scope. Uh, and if I do my little trick where I assign that to a global, and I say scope.title, it's Senators. And if I change that, uh, to Canadians, uh, nothing happened because I need to use scope.apply to make that change happen. And internally, Angular has this uh, digest and sort of loop that's basically listening for changes. It's sort of like, uh, if you're familiar with game pro programming, it's like the big event loop, the master loop that's just sitting and, and sort of code is evaluated on, and there's a tick that happens every, you know, every second or whatever. Angular has something similar um, and so because uh, I'm modifying the scope outside of Angular's directives, I need to call scope.apply to, uh, to make that reflect in the UI. Normally you don't have to call .apply, uh, it's just something to be aware of. Okay, so that's cool, we've got our title, um, and let's say this is you know, the home page. And uh, maybe we want to add uh, another piece of dynamic state, uh, we want to add this message. And the message that we want to add to start with uh, is going to have something to do with our um, our images, because that's going to demonstrate a couple of the other features of Angular. So let's set the default message to um, mouse over these images to see a directive at work. And now you can see that my message is there. And basically, that should give you a hint as to what we're going to add for dynamic behavior next. Um, and so one of the things that's really cool about thinking of your UI code or your, your markup as sort of declarative is thinking about attributes that you know might not be part of your HTML5 vernacular uh, that can have uh, sort of declarative implications about what's going to happen. And so the, the thing that I thought was cool when I first started creating directives, um, and there's many different types of directives, but for this case we're going to talk about attribute directives, was the fact that my markup became sort of self-documenting. I could look at this fragment uh, with, you know, a little bit of the context of knowledge of Angular, and just by reading it, uh, you know, this, these attributes. Um, so let's say, you know, this one's going to show, show his message when hovered. So some somebody, whether it's a designer or a developer, could come in here and say, oh, "Oh, that's cool. You know, when when this message when, when this image gets hovered, I'm gonna show a message." And maybe that you know isn't super clear, but uh, at least it's a lot clearer than having to go to some external JavaScript file, uh, figure out what DOM node it's selecting and what model it's working with. Um, this sort of tight connection of I've got this DOM fragment and I've got an Angular scope, and I know that those are kept in sync. Um, it is very useful. So this is this is a directive that we're going to create. We're going to do it for both of these things, these images, which kind of shows how you can reuse these things. And uh, let's have a message property, um, which is going to be uh, I'm the first image, and 
I'm the second image. And when we hover those, uh, we want to show a message. So I'm going to reload. Nothing happens. Um, Angular will internally look and see if there's a directive that matches those attributes. Uh, it knows that there, there isn't, but it doesn't fail, and nothing bad happens. So let's go and add that behavior. Uh, and we do that with something called directive. And uh, you'll notice that my directive was um, dasherized, and that's sort of the, uh, the idea with the HTML5 attributes. Um, but when you define the directive name, you're going to use uh, camel case. So shows message when hovered. So that's our directive. Uh, and the general form that directives take is they're going to return an object literal, which configures uh, Angular's um, so that when it invokes this thing, it's going to invoke a function under the hood and grab this configuration and then return me the, the thing that I need. Um, and the first thing you'll run into is this restrict keyword. And uh, we're going to restrict to A, which is for attribute. Um, here's the, the crash course in the different types. There's attribute, C equals class name. So you can actually create your own directives as class names. So when Angular sees that you've added a specific class uh, to an element, it will invoke this directive. Um, you can use E for element, which is basically an HTML element, and this is what allows you to create your own custom syntax. Uh, if you've watched John Lindquist's videos, I think he has a good one where he adds a Superman element and a message. Um, and the last one is M, which is HTML comments. You can actually have directives that are comments. Uh, for most, the most part, starting out in Angular, you'll probably just work with attribute directives. Uh, the, the amazing thing about Angular is that you don't even have to use uh, any of them to get started. You know, the two-way binding and the scope and a controller is really sufficient to get you uh, kind of started. The other thing we need to provide to this directive is a link function. And Angular will call the link function to basically bind um, the, our directive and the piece of, of DOM fragment that it's on uh, with this function. And this function gets some arguments passed to it. It gets the scope, uh, the specific element, and any attributes on that element. And so for our case, what we want to do is uh, we want to grab a handle to that original message um, that exists in our scope right here. And so this scope is basically the same as, as this one um, because it's inside of, this directive is being used inside of uh, an element or a fragment, the home HTML, uh, that uh, is instantiated with this controller. So that's what that's what the scope is coming from. So let's grab uh, our original message uh, equals scope dot message and let's uh, do do an element dot find mouse over and a function. And if you're familiar with jQuery, this is where you might have used something like uh, you know, jQuery select element dot on, mouse over, something like that. Um, you'll notice that in my vendor list of vendor dependencies, I didn't include jQuery. You can use Angular uh, completely without jQuery, uh, and it uses something called JQ Lite under the hood, which is what this API is. And it's basically a subset of jQuery functions. It's super light. That's why it's called JQ Lite. Um, but it allows you to uh, manipulate the DOM. And sort of as a rule of thumb, if you are going to add manipulations like this, um, directives are probably the only place that's appropriate to do it uh, in terms of the Angular lifecycle. You think about uh, jQuery or even backbone apps, your sort of default inclination is to monkey with the DOM. Uh, Angular tries to uh, limit, or the, the ethos is such that you should really limit the amount that you uh, monkey with the DOM. And so, but if you are going to do it, uh, you should do it inside of directives. That's sort of the, the rule of thumb. So our link function, when this directive is detected, uh, we're going to grab a handle of that original scope message. And when we mouse over, um, we're just going to change the message. And we're going to grab it from the attributes, because we stored the message in this other attribute on the element. So let's grab the message, attributes.message. And that's as easy it is as it is. And let's do uh, scope.apply. That's where we're monkeying with things internally. 
and when they mouse out, let's say that uh, equals original message so that we can restore it. And again, we'll call scope.apply. And now if we reload this page, uh, when we mouse over, it should work. And it didn't. So again, I'm not going to stop the video. Let's see if we can figure out what went wrong. Show. So I apologize. I know I said I wasn't going to stop the video, but I uh, got a little pop-up that my startup disk was almost out of space from recording in ScreenFlow. Uh, anyway, I figured out what it was. Um, I didn't actually have anything wrong in my code. Uh, there's a bug in Chrome that's really kind of annoying. Um, so if you see that I'm mousing over these and nothing's happening, uh, it seems like whenever you have developer tools open uh, in the latest stable channel, uh, some, some uh, updates to the DOM aren't reflected. So if you can see now, once I close the developer tools, I can see that I'm the first house and I'm the second house and that directive is actually working. So that confused the heck out of me here for a second, but I have actually run into that bug with Chrome developer tools uh, before. So it reminds me that I need to go and submit uh, a patch for that or an issue at least. Um, anyway, so let's kind of review here. We've got uh, that shows message when hover directive, we're using it uh, in two places, but we only have the code once. And we've got the message, uh, the attribute. And I talked about how uh, we can look up values on the scope uh, and it'll look up the scope chain. Uh, so if the scope message doesn't exist, it's gonna go look up to the parent scope, which is for the controller, uh, find that message. And uh, I talked about uh, JQ Lite. This is probably a good time to uh, go take a look at that. If you're looking for the reference, you can just look at angular.element uh, and it will show you um, the methods that JQ Lite provides. And it's trying to match the jQuery API as much as possible but uh, it doesn't provide all of the functionality and some of the functionality is, is limited. It kind of describes the differences here. And so yeah, it's good to familiarize yourself with that. You can use jQuery with Angular and if uh, jQuery is included before Angular is loaded, uh, Angular will detect that and use jQuery internally. But I would recommend that uh, for any experiments you do with Angular that uh, you just work without jQuery. So now we've got uh, a pretty decent app. The last sort of piece that we need is uh, this button at the bottom here, the logout button, so that when we click logout, we can get back to the home page. So uh, let's do that. And we can do that with another directive, um, ng click. And you should be familiar now with the fact that uh, this ng click is a directive. It's declaratively telling Angular that when this thing is clicked, I want you to go to the, the uh, the, the scope for this, look for that function and invoke it. Uh, so let's go back to our home controller and we'll say scope.logout is a function. And it's going to uh, just location.path back to the login. And uh, again, we need to inject the location service that Angular provides so that we can do that. So we just add it as a function argument. And I'll talk a little bit uh, about uh, injecting these dependencies and how this works. Um, but for now, if we go and reload the page and we hit logout, we can see we got redirect back. Things are working. If we type, type Ralph as our username, uh, we'll get redirected. And if I clo close Chrome DevTools, those uh, hover things will work. Uh, so just to be clear, that's not a bug in Angular, that's a bug in Chrome DevTools latest. And now we have kind of this full featured app that's working. Uh, the other cool thing, uh, if I didn't mention it before, is you'll notice that I, I can click on the button or I can hit enter on the keyboard and that uh, ng submit will handle both of those to submit the form. So just a lot of things, you know, you might be familiar with uh, binding a submit handler in jQuery, preventing the default event and all that. Angular really uh, abstracts away having to think about the DOM a whole lot. So you're left with, you know, app code, which is imperative, just monkeying with the state of things, and sort of this declarative UI code. Um, so I know uh, one of the things that kind of irked me when I was putting this together was, well, I've got these concerns about login and logout, and that doesn't really seem like it belongs inside of this controller. Uh, if we're thinking about code in terms of the single responsibility principle, I, I really want this controller to uh, not be concerned with my authentication stuff. 
And so one of the, the cool things that uh, Angular gives you is the ability to extract those things and inject your own dependencies. So, you know, I've got location, dollar location, and dollar scope. These are um, magic Angular things that uh, are provided for you by default. But you, there's nothing preventing you from injecting your own dependencies. And the way that you do that uh, is by um, extracting things into uh, services. So we'll use a factory. And I'm going to call this an authentication service. And we're going to pull that location dependency out of our controllers because you know, maybe they don't really care about the location. And we're just going to uh, pull it into this authentication service. And uh, a factory uh, just gives you the ability to, to uh, return a, an object which has a bunch of properties on it. And so we're going to return an object with two functions, a login function and a logout function. And so we can encapsulate sort of the concerns for authentication inside of here. And the login function is going to take those uh, credentials that we can pass it in. Uh, and so now we can pull in all of that behavior here uh, and stick it in here. And instead of that, we can just say credentials because it's a local variable. And that's nicely encapsulated. Uh, and we can do the same here and stick that inside of logout. And now, how do I get this thing in? Well, I've registered this authentication service, and there's nothing magic about this name. It could be called uh, foobar. Um, I just chose to call it authentication service. And I've encapsulated the behavior of, uh, this is my interface. I've got a login and a logout function uh, for the authentication service. And I've declared it with a factory. Uh, there's a number of different ways you can uh, declare services in Angular. Uh, I'm not going to go over them here. There's a couple of good videos that John Lindquist has, but uh, Factory is probably the one you'll use most commonly. The, the the big point here is that this is basically acting as an interface, and I've got two methods, login and logout. And I'm injecting the location uh, object in here so that I can work with it. And now uh, I can use that just simply by passing it in here as an argument. And so this argument matches uh, the value here that it was declared as. So I'm going to use that in both cases. And uh, for login, I'm just going to say, uh, I'm going to call authentication service dot login, and I'm going to pass the credentials. Scope dot credentials. And similarly for logout, authentication service dot logout. And now, uh, you know, I've exposed those uh, sort of to the public interface, which is my scope here, uh, that the markup can can use, but it doesn't need to know anything about the internals. And I've uh, extracted that stuff into a service object. Uh, and the benefit here is um, encapsulation and isolation. And now, if I wanted to create alternative um, services that were responsible for the authentication, all I'd have to do is match uh, the interface, the login and logout. And due to the Lishkov substitution principle, I should be able to swap out any other authentication service that matches that interface and just drop it in uh, to the controller, and things should just work transparently. So that's that's sort of the the idea around services in Angular is extracting things into uh, interfaces or pieces of information uh, that will be injected throughout your application. So let's see if that actually works. There's the logout function. And I'll go back to Ralph and log in, and my validations still work. And I can hit enter. And things are working. Let's make sure that that code is actually loaded. Let's look at the sources tab. And uh, we can see that there's my authentication service. And I can actually insert a breakpoint on the location and see that it got hit. So that's how you can kind of inject your own dependencies. So if, you f if you're starting out with Angular and you find your controllers are morphing into these gigantic objects. Uh, there's probably some concerns you can extract, and the logical place to uh, extract them if they're service related is into a service uh, with the factory. Um, if you have static data that you need to pull out and make available, uh, there's you know a factory it might be a good place to do it. Uh, there's a couple other approaches that uh, John Lindquist talks about in his videos. And so, sort of to wrap up, um, the last thing I want to talk about is how this dependency injection works. Because it's a little bit like magic when you first look at it. And there's nothing too mysterious about it. 
So, uh, you know, I've kind of been cheating here and using the short form of uh, defining these things. Um, but if I actually went to minify this application um, using something like Uglify, it would uh, totally bust everything because one of the things Uglify does is it mangles argument names um, because, you know, in the minify JavaScript, uh, it doesn't matter whether this function has dollar scope or whether it has A and B. You know, the browser doesn't care. It just needs to be able to map those function arguments to uh, the right thing. But uh, in Angular, it's particularly important, the name uh, of the argument. And so the way that you get around that um, and the way Angular's dependency ejection works is it actually, uh, when, it, when it's going to look to inject a dependency when this function is called, it's going to look up the value of this uh, in the registry internally in Angular. And it does that uh, by going and finding that thing and two-stringing the function. Uh, so that it can actually get the name of the dependency. So it's going to two-string this function and look for the authentication service string inside of its, in this app's uh, list of factories. And so how to avoid that when minifying? Well, basically you just need to provide a little bit of extra information. We need to provide an array uh, where the first n arguments are the list of dependencies and the last one is the function. And so it adds a little bit more um, overhead to uh, your markup. But doing this and adding those things explicitly and naming them uh, basically allows minification to work. So let's do this one as well. And things should just work. Yep, there we go. Um, and so what this does is when Angular will go to two-string the function, um, the minification process doesn't monkey with strings uh, because it can't reduce them any more than it has. And so now we have this list of explicit dependencies. And when Angular will two-string this function, uh, it's going to go and look for this string and map it to this argument name. So now these argument names you know, don't even matter. I could have foo and bar, um, and it will map these things. And just to prove that say foo.credentials and foo.login and bar.login bar maps to our authentication service and if we go back here oh I'm still referencing the scope so foo.credentials cool and things just work so you can see how internally uh, it doesn't matter what these arguments are named. Once I've explicitly defined those dependencies here as strings, uh, it's going to go and map this authentication service to that argument and this scope to that. Um, but for when you're work, you know, just playing around with it in, in development mode, uh, it's totally appropriate to, uh, to work around it with a shortcut. Just something you should be aware of um, when you go, if you're building this thing for production. Uh, it would be interesting to see if there's some sort of post or pre-production task that could automatically go and uh, inject those things so that you didn't have to do that um, in your actual app code. Because that seems like sort of a cross-cutting configuration concern. So maybe somebody, some enterprising individual out there could go and, and uh, build a, a grunt plugin that did that after the fact or something like that. I'm just going to replace these things. So yeah, that's uh, that's my introduction to Angular, and uh, this code is available up on uh, GitHub. Uh, let's go to Lineman Angular Templates. Um, and this code is actually a little bit more full-featured. Um, I basically extracted uh, a lot of these lessons and stuffed them into a Lineman config. Uh, and what this gives you is the same app, but uh, there's a little bit more of a build process involved using Lineman. And if you're not familiar with Lineman, I'm going to add a, a link at the end that you can go watch a, a screencast about Lineman. But basically, uh, we pre-compile all of the templates to avoid those XHRs uh, when you're fetching templates um, and split things into separate files so that not everything exists inside of this gigantic app.js file. Uh, and that'll show you how to do that. There's a couple of other um, configuration things. So if you're kind of play around with this uh, repository, which is available on GitHub as well, I'll include the link, uh, and you want to kind of take it to the next level and add, you know, what would this look like if I added a build step? What would it look like? What are the grunt tasks that I need? That's kind of what Lineman does. Uh, it's sort of analogous to Yeoman, uh, if you've used Yeoman, just a little bit lighter weight. 
Um, so I hope you enjoyed this introduction. And if you have any questions, please feel free to hit me on Twitter. I'm uh, dmosier on Twitter and on GitHub, wherever. I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, I usually hang out in IRC uh, as Dave Mo on Freenode as well. So feel free to ping me. Thanks.